In this simulation, we see a heat engine being used to pump water out of the ground. This was a great invention. You could just start a fire underneath it and give it a spin and it would pump your water for you, much easier than pumping the water by hand. So this engine converts heat energy, that chaotic random energy that is released when a log is burned, into mechanical energy. There are many types of heat engines. This is an example of an external combustion engine. The fire happens outside rather than inside the engine. The engine runs on the Stirling cycle. Air is heated at the bottom of the engine chamber, then moves upward by a displacer. A displacer is just an airtight object that takes up volume, so the hot air has to move around it. When the hot air arrives at the top of the engine, it pushes upward on the piston. The heated air is at slightly higher pressure than the outside air, so there was a net upward force due to this pr pressure. Now this heated air cools, and the displacer moves it back down to the bottom of the engine to be heated again. When the piston moves up and down, this means that the volume of the air overall in the engine has changed. We call the air the working fluid because the hot air in the engine is the thing that's doing the work in pushing on the piston. When the working fluid is heated and cooled, its pressure changes. So the system is going through a variety of volume and pressure changes. We can check out these volume and pressure changes on the graph at right. This is a plot of pressure on the vertical axis and volume on the horizontal axis. If we pause the simulation and manipulate the handle on the graph, we can watch the engine cycle through its different states. When the pressure is high, the temperature is high. This curve is known as an isotherm. We can use the ideal gas law to calculate the temperature of this curve if we wanted. When the pressure is low, the temperature is also low. You'll notice that there are also some vertical lines on this plot of the engine cycle. This is an idealized representation of what happens when the air is passing along the outside of the displacer. Since the displacer itself has some temperature that approximates the average temperature of the system, the air as it moves past it is either preheated or pre-cooled. In this model, the air volume doesn't change during this time. It just moves from one place to another. Realistic engines will not have such idealized engine curves. However, they are useful when first learning about these processes. The graph at top is an energy flow diagram. The reservoir of heat is located at the top of this graph, but it really represents the energy input to the engine at the bottom by the high temperature burning logs during a single engine cycle. Some of this energy is siphoned off to do work. The efficiency, measured as a percentage, tells us the amount of input energy from the logs that ends up doing work in pumping water up from underground. You'll notice that this engine cannot be 100% efficient. Some energy must leave the system as well. This is called waste heat. The work done by a piston in an expanding engine is the area bounded by the graph on the right-hand side. If you compare this bounded area on the right-hand graph in appropriate units to the output work labeled on the left-hand graph, they should be the same. Notice that we can increase the amount of work done in each stroke in one of two ways. One thing we can do is we can increase the stroke length. This increase, increases the amount by which the volume of the working fluid changes over a single cycle. The second thing we can do is increase the heat input. As long as we can keep the top of the engine cool in the meantime, it's a good idea to add as much heat as we can if we want the engine to have a lot of power. If the top of the engine gets too hot though, then the area bounded by the graph will shrink again and we will lose efficiency. A temperature difference is required for the flow of heat. This is a fundamental thermodynamic principle. One of the most exciting projects you can get involved in when learning physics is to build your own heat engine. You can find plans online for tin can Stirling engines that are easy to build and require a minimum number of tools. Talk to your teacher or parent about building your own engine that runs off a simple candle. Thanks for watching.